that uh, I thought was uh, was very good, and I wanted to do it again. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 7. While you're doing that, I'm going to put this up on the screen. Matthew chapter 7. And uh, uh, as I said last week, um, this is the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> Maybe we'll do that at the end. Um, uh, this is the Sermon on the Mount. Five cha- or three chapters, it takes Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Jesus is speaking to a crowd of people. And this is my opinion. Um, I think that as Jesus gets to the end of this sermon, which is where we're at this morning... As my opinion, I think that he's doing what we often do when we write a letter. We leave the most important stuff till the end. We write the stuff at the very end that we really want um, the person that we're writing to uh, to remember. And uh, again, my opinion, I think that's what Jesus is doing here at the end. Because last week, he reminded us of uh, the uh, importance of being able to recognize truth from error. Being able to recognize uh, uh, the real deal teacher from the false teacher. And uh, more specifically, he uh, called us to remember... Um, I'm going to wait a little bit. There's something fascinating about the screen here. Nobody's even paying attention. <laughs> you, uh, okay. I, well, it's, just, it's, a, uh, it's an over... Like it's a general, generalization. Generalization. Broad, broad. Painting you with a broad brush. But yes, of course, brown noser. <laughs> Come on. Yes, I'm wrong with you, right? Teacher's pet? Yeah. Teacher. Okay, good, good. There's a few. There's a few. Um, maybe we'll do that um, at the end. Um, where were we? I don't know. Okay, yes. Yeah. Save all the important stuff for the end. Okay, save all the important stuff for the end. Um, important to recognize false teachers, false teaching, but more specifically uh, for us, um, Jesus talked about last week the importance of just knowing whether or not we're saved. Knowing whether or not we're born again. And uh, as some have said, the scariest verses in all of the Bible are Matthew chapter 7. That there will come a day when some will stand before Jesus Christ thinking that they know Him, thinking that they're right with Him, only to discover uh, that they are not. And so Jesus makes it very clear how we can identify ourselves as believers or, or not uh, believers. Uh, well, this passage that we get to at the end of the chapter, again, again, in my opinion, I think God, uh, Jesus is leaving the last uh, stuff, the, the most important stuff till the end, is where I would call this the tipping point, uh, getting down to the nitty gritty. Um, are we going to obey it, or are we not? Uh, Jesus has spoken for three chapters and given uh, instruction on every area of life that you can think of, and he gets down to the end and basically puts out the challenge, are you going to listen and do it, or is it just going to go in one ear and out the other? And um, uh, that's where we pick up this morning, verse number 24, Jesus is going to introduce us to two different groups of people. And the two very stark, different, starkly different groups of people. The first uh, person that he introduces us to is the wise man or the wise woman or the wise young person here. Uh, the second person that he introduces us to is the fool. And uh, the Bible has a lot to say about both the wise man uh, and the fool. And almost everything that the Bible says about these two groups of people is a stark contrast. 
Uh, not a lot of similarities between the wise person and the foolish person. In fact, listen to these various verses from Psalms and Isaiah and Proverbs. The fool says in his heart, finish it for me, there is no God. Only the fool would make such a statement or believe uh, such a lie. Isaiah 32, the fool speaks folly and his heart is busy with iniquity. Proverbs 3, the wise will inherit honor, but fools get disgrace. Proverbs 10, the wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. Proverbs 10, the wise lay up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool brings ruin near. I have a list here. I won't read them all. We can go on and on. Uh, the lips of the wise spread knowledge. Not so, not so, the hearts of fools. The wise person has eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. It's better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise, of the wise than to hear the song of the fools. Not a lot good in Scripture. In fact, nothing good in Scripture to say of the foolish person. And just a very stark contrast between the one who chooses to live the life of foolishness, and by the way, that is a choice, and the one who chooses to live the life of wisdom. And I hope that, and pray, as you hear those verses, I hope that you, as you come uh, to hear this morning, to hear the Word of God, uh, your heart just cries out to be that wise person. In every area of life, um, not just selectively choosing, uh, I think we're all guilty of this. Uh, God, I want to be wise in this area, and I, and I want to submit in this area, and I, I want to choose you in this area, but, but there, there are a couple areas, God, that, that I just assume live as the foolish person. And uh, uh, God has called us to be wise. He's, he tells us in, in James chapter 1 that if we lack that wisdom, we can ask Him, and He gives it to us generously. He gives it to us uh, liberally. And so it's the fool and the wise man that we talk about this morning. And I want to introduce this portion of Scripture uh, with a story. And I think some of you have heard this because I know I've told it before, but we have a lot of new people. So I'll tell the story again because you know, it just fits very well uh, with this passage. A number of years ago, uh, my family was down in Orlando, Florida, and we, of course we're doing the, uh, the Disney thing. And I went out one day to pick up a few groceries. And uh, on that trip... Off in the distance, I saw uh, what turned out to be just a very small uh, amusement park in Orlando or, or, or thereabouts. And uh, what I saw off in the distance was a huge uh, tower. And if you kind of picture this, you ever told this story? Some of you remember the story? Everybody remember the story? Some haven't heard it good. Um, picture kind of like the St. Louis Arch or a half of McDonald's Arch. And I'm looking at it from the distance and wondering what it is. And, and as I got a little bit closer, I noticed what it was was actually a huge human swim. Um, so it was this huge, huge arch. As I recall, I think it was 390 feet tall. And uh, there was a cable that came down from the top of this arch, the center of it, and probably hung maybe eight feet off of the ground. And uh, um, uh, about 400 feet from that tower was another just straight up skinny tower. Um, uh, again, 400 feet. So you've got this arch, and then you've got this tower 400 feet away from it. And here was the object of it. Uh, you would go over to this cable, and you would lay down on a, uh, a, a platform. And they would raise this platform. You're all in a harness, harnessed up really like a straight jacket. And they would raise you up to that uh, cable, and they would strap you in, and then they would drop the platform. Well, there was a second cable that was attached to you, and it was attached to that tower that was 400 feet away. And so the object of the ride was um, uh, when they say go, they start a motor on that second cable, that second tower, and it pulls you all the way up 400 feet to the top of this second tower. And then as you get to the top, uh, you would hear this countdown from a bullhorn, three, two, one, and you'd pull this ripcord, and it would release that second cable that's holding you up to that tower, and you would swing down like a huge pendulum. Yeah, just, just eight feet from the ground, and you would just fly. And of course, the first couple hundred feet is really a free fall because the cable hasn't quite, um, you, you don't feel the slack, but there's slack. You don't feel the tightness of it yet. And so you're just saying, well, I saw that. I had never seen anything like it. And it so happened that our trip had coincided with a trip of some friends of ours who were also in Orlando. I got on the phone and I said, Jack, I've just seen the most incredible ride. Can I come get you? And he said, I am in. I went and I got him and we came back and we, we 
filled out our mountain of paperwork of liability release and, and we began to stand in line. And you know, you've been to amusement parks and um, you know, the, 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 the larger rides have a lot of warning signs. Um, and this was, this was one of those, where you get in line and as soon as you get in line, um, you start to read the signs. Like, do not go on this ride if you've ever had a history of back problems, a history of heart problems, uh, if you're pregnant, of course, if you've got neck problems, all of the warnings, um, they were all over the place. And it was a lengthy line, so there were, there were turns and zigzags, and at every single corner, I noticed, boy, there's a new set of signs every single time I take a corner. And by the time you get to the, where you're ready to go on the ride, you've got to memorize well, you got into this last room where they suit you up into this straight jacket type harness. And again, all of the walls are plastered with these warnings. And uh, they're putting this harness on me, and, and uh, they've got it all cinched up. And, and I look at Jack, and they're cinching him up. And, and uh, Jack says, stop. And I said, what? And, and before they could cinch up the side of his harness, he says, just a minute. And, and he reaches into his pocket, and he pulls out this tiny little wall. And he said, Rusty, just in case I have a third heart attack, I want you to know where my nitroglycerin pills are. Of course, I started pleading with Jack. Jack, this was my idea. Your wife will never forgive me. We're, we're done. It doesn't matter how we paid. Let's get out of this line. Let's go. And, and of course, Jack, uh, he's excited. He would have uh, nothing of that. Um, he wouldn't hear it. Um, we come to the end of the story, praise God, Jack was fun. We did the ride, uh, nothing happened, um, uh, he assured me nothing would, and we just left there with just a great uh, story to tell and a good laugh. Um, but I tell you this story uh, for this reason. Uh, the story illustrates for us a very important, critical truth. That as believers, as Christ followers, and if you don't know Christ this morning, you as well. A truth that we need to take to heart and make application of, and it is this truth. There is a stark difference between knowing what is true. There's a stark difference between knowing what God expects. Knowing what is right and wrong, knowing what is moral, knowing what God desires. I mean, there's a stark difference between having that knowledge up here and actually making application of that truth. Getting knowledge is easy. I mean, we can sit here every Sunday morning, and, and maybe we take notes, maybe we don't, but, but it's going up here, and, and, and we're learning things. We could get up every single morning and, and open up God's Word and, 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 and we could read it and, 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 and study it and, and we could memorize Scripture. And I, I hope we're doing that. I pray that that is our heart's desire and that we're doing that. But there is a very big difference between actually accumulating knowledge, which is very easy to do, and then making application of that truth, which is not quite as simple. It's not quite as easy. And I think sometimes that we trade or we think that somehow the fact that I have accumulated the knowledge, although I'm not going to make application of all of it, I think sometimes that we can look, well, at least I've accumulated. Is it not better? Isn't that better than nothing? When in reality, that's not the case. Because you see, once we know something, now we're responsible for it. And it would actually be better if you and I didn't accumulate the knowledge than for you and I to know what God expects and then to disregard it. And sadly, all of us are guilty of this. The church is full of, of people who know what God has called us to, but choose at times to refuse to submit to it and make application. And of course, that's why the Bible says for him that knows to do right and doesn't do it, it is what? It is sin. That's why James 1.23 says, don't just be hearers of the word and not a doer. He goes on, anyone who's just a hearer and not a doer is just, is just deceiving himself. And over and over we read in scripture this, this warning, not just to hear, uh, but to do. Let me read <clears throat> the text here, and, and you'll see where we're going. Matthew 7, verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, 
will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Verse 26, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Let me just stop there for a minute. The Bible has a lot to say that contrasts the wise person with the foolish person. But here in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus actually gives us some similarities between the wise man and the foolish man. Uh, similarities that I would suggest may actually be a little bit uh, surprising. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus says, Whoever hears these words of mine and does them, will be like the wise man. Verse 26, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man. Notice similarity number one is that both the wise man and the foolish man hear the truth of God's word. Is that a bit surprising? I take you by surprise a little bit. I, I, I know that I tend to, to think, and, and in fact, I've had opportunity to counsel many, many people, many husbands and wives and, and, and parents and, 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 and people who are struggling perhaps with, with just how to live life, how to manage money. And, and I've had opportunity to meet with, with I can count a number of people. And uh, I'll tell you, when somebody, I sit down with somebody, and they begin to talk to me, and, and here's what I'm struggling with. Here's the area of life that I'm struggling with. Uh, I want to think the best. And, and my first thought, as I find out what they're struggling with, and, and, and we, 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 we make this appointment to get together, my first thought is, they probably just don't know. There's, there's probably just not an awareness of what God's Word has to say about that particular area of life. And I know that at times there, there is that ignorance, there is that, un, that, that lack of awareness, but, but I will sit down with, with these people and, and we'll begin to open up God's Word. Well, because God's Word, we understand, I hope you understand, has everything we need. And after everything we need for every single area of life, this is where we go. And so I'll begin to open up God's Word and say, well, well here's what God says about the marriage relationship. Uh, here's what God says about, uh, about, about parenting. I know you were told that, that kids weren't born with an instruction name, but they were, and, and it's right here. And, and then I begin to open up, up the God's Word, or, or somebody maybe they're just struggling with how to, how to manage their money, a big thing today, and, and, and they make a lot of money, but they just can't seem to make it. Well, here's what God's Word, about, God's word says about uh, our finances and, and how to manage those. And we'll sit down and we'll open up the truths of God's Word. And then maybe we'll meet a month later or... Or sometimes even a year later, we'll kind of regroup. And, and how are things going? I'll tell you, sometimes it's actually a little bit discouraging. Because not a lot has changed. Not a lot has been affected or, or altered in, in their lives. And there's still that hopelessness and, and, and that lack of growth. And, and I'll tell you, what I've observed uh, at this point is that there is one common denominator. One common denominator that exists almost all of the time with those who profess to know Christ and who continue to struggle hopelessly in any particular area of life. And that one common denominator is this, a knowledge of what God expects, a knowledge of the power that God desires to work through the life of that individual, coupled with an unwillingness to action to it. Coupled with an unwillingness to actually make application of those truths in their lives. An unwillingness to make uh, the sacrifices that are necessary to allow God to do uh, what He wants to do. I'll tell you what, as I look at my own life, uh, I'm 47 this year, and I've known Christ for uh, most of my life. And I look at my life at times, and I, it's important we need to reflect and just kind of look at what's going on and, and uh, examine ourselves, the Scripture says. And there are times that I look at my life and, and I look at things that I'm still struggling with. I look at things that you know, God's working in me and He's changing me and He's molding me and He's shaping me and, 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 and I'm thankful for that. But I look at some areas of my life and I hate to have to confess this to you, but I look at them and I say, why am I still dealing with that? Why is that still something that I am dealing with? Why is that temptation not long gone? Why, why is victory not, not, not a regular part of my life in regards to that? 
And I have to confess to you that those areas that I still struggle with today, I do not struggle with because I do not know what God's Word says. I'm not struggling with them because I am ignorant of God's Word or I am ignorant of the truth that the Holy Spirit lives inside of me to empower me and to give me victory. I know that. And I confess to you that I continue to struggle with some of those things because of that occasional lack of willingness to just do what God wants me to do. To just do what the Holy Spirit who lives inside of me wants me to do and empowers me to do. And I know that in those moments that I am functioning and I am choosing to live as the fool. And I know that as we sit here, I stand here and you sit here today, I know that there are some of you who have already thought of that thing. You've already thought of that thing that God has spoken to your heart. Last month, last week, a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, and you've not yet responded in obedience. You're acting as the fool. You're choosing to live, not as the wise man, as the fool. God has called us not just to hear, but to do because Ecclesiastes says that the fool walks in darkness. And my challenge for you in regards to this first similarity between the wise man and the fool is so what is it? What is it that God has been speaking to your heart about? What is it that you have yet to surrender so that God can make you brand new in that particular area? How long is it going to be before you finally do it? I got a text this week. <coughs> It was an encouraging text. And I asked uh, Chris Allen if it would be okay if I shared it. Um, I think it was Tuesday. Out of the blue, I got this text. And this is what it said. It said, thank you, my brothers in Christ, for your witness and mentoring in my life. I pray for you continually, for faith, for strength, and wisdom, that you may best serve our Father God, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. You are a blessing in my life. Stay strong and true so that others may also be blessed as I have been. It's an encouraging text. Came out of nowhere. And it was encouraging for two reasons. One, it was just encouraging. The content of it was, was encouraging. Do you know what happened? You know, on Tuesday, I closed my phone and my first thought was there's somebody who's taking the Word of God and he's doing it. Because we've been talking for weeks about being the body of Christ. About being an encouragement in each other's lives. About praying for each other. About being a sharpening influence in each other's lives. And I said, thank you, God, that somebody is taking that to heart. Hearing and doing the Word of God. It's not enough to hear. We need to be people that do, and I know that that is going on in pockets here at Deerfield Bible Church. I know that Chris Allen isn't the only one doing that. I know that people are praying for people, encouraging people, getting involved in people's lives. Rusty, yeah. I had that same blessing happen on behalf of your position this week from Jeff Kraft. So, Jeff, thank you. Amen. So we're going to be people here and uh, do uh, the similarity number one, the, both the wise man and the foolish man hear the word of God. Here's similarity number two. Let me go back and read those verses again. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rock here, by the way, uh, Jesus is the rock, but more specifically here, the rock is hearing and doing the word of God. And the wise man heard and did and built his house on the rock. Uh, verse number 26, everyone that hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the rock. Here's similarity number two. Number one was both the wise man and the foolish man hear the word of God. Similarity number two, both the wise man and the foolish man actually succeed in building a house. Uh, again, that, that takes me by surprise. And in fact, I don't want to question God's perfect design, but there are times in my life uh, in which I wish it wasn't that way. God actually enables you and I to disregard His commands, to, to know what He says to do and not do it, and actually build 
our house is sin. Of course, we're not talking about a physical house here. We're not talking about uh, sticks and then mortar and then nails and hammers. We're talking about those houses of our lives that every single one of us is building into right now. If you're married, I trust you're building into that house of marriage. And if you have kids, I hope we're, we're building into that house of, of raising children. Uh, some of you are building your, your career. Some of you are just trying to build your, your life. Um, Jesus says very clearly, listen, we can be the foolish person. We can hear the word of God and we can disregard it and we can build a house. I wish it wasn't that way. And, and God's ways are perfect. In my finite mind, I, I don't see it all. But, but there are times I wish, God, can't, can't you just, can't it be different? Wouldn't it be great if just every time I opened up God's word and read what it said and ignored it, that everything I tried to do failed? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be great if, I, okay, God, I read this morning in uh, 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 John chapter 13, and I didn't love people, and I went out and I didn't love people, and my whole day just fell apart. And the same thing happened yesterday, and the day before, and the day before, because God, you just will not let me have success whenever I disregard your truth. I think that'd be great, because it would be that kick in the pants that I just need at times to remember, no, God, your ways are best, and your work, God doesn't do that. And, and I think there are a couple reasons for that. One, of course, is that uh, nobody wants flowers on a Valentine's Day that they only got because they were going to make life really hard on the person who didn't give it to them. <laughs> nobody wants those flowers. <laughs> nobody wants a, a gift or, or, or quote, love because if I don't give it to you, you're going to be, you're going to give me the silent treat. You're going to be angry with me. You're going to make my life really uh, difficult. God doesn't want that. He, he, we're not robots. He doesn't want us obeying him because uh, uh, if we don't, life just falls apart. Which ultimately, by the way, it will. In the long term, it will. But in the short term, we can build our homes. A second reason I think God does it this way is because uh, sometimes you and I need to build our homes, those things that we dreamt of, those things that we thought we would find life in, we actually need to find success in the building of our homes to discover that that actually really wasn't what we were looking for. I have a nephew like that, Stephen Bodie. He grew up in a Christian home, Christian school, uh, went to a Bible college, and, and, and he just wanted nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And he, he built the various homes of his life that he always wanted to build. He went down that road of pleasure and drugs and women and, and you name it. And for a period of time, <laughs> Stephen Bodie was at the top of his game. And he loved his life. He loved where he was disregarding the truth of God's word. The Hebrews says very clearly that the pleasures of sin are for a season. We build our houses, but if we build them without Jesus Christ, they only last for so long. And finally, a day came in which Stephen Bodie gave his life to Jesus Christ. And I asked him, I said, Stephen, what was it? What was it? You had everything that you thought you wanted. You went down every path that you thought you wanted. And, and so to speak, you built every house that you thought you wanted to build. What was it? And he said it was actually the success of building those houses that made me realize it wasn't what I wanted at all. It was because God let me try it that I came back to Jesus Christ because he is the only one who can satisfy. He is the only one who can fulfill but see, God will let us. He will let us build homes without Him. He will let us build our lives without Him. And I call this the uh, deception or the deceptiveness of success. The deceptiveness of success. Because I've been there and you've been there and I've heard other people uh, make the statement, look at my life. Everything is great. Uh, I've got a wife, and, and our marriage is great, and, and I've got kids, and, and I'm raising them, and, and they're getting an education, and they're going to college, and, and I've got a career, and, and everything is being built. Therefore, I must be okay. I, I must be right with God. Because look at how He's blessing me and making my life work. It's the deceptiveness of success. Uh, because... And we forget, as we looked last week, that sometimes it is the kindness of God that is intended to lead us to repentance. Sometimes God pours out His kindness in an effort to simply lead us to repentance. Because ultimately, people, we don't do anything without Him. 
He, he made the world and he's holding the world together. And any success that you and I have is only because of the graciousness and the goodness of God. Whether we wreck to lead us uh, to repentance. Similarity number one, the wise man and the foolish man both hear the word of God. That is some of, that's all of us at times. That is some of you here today, right now. That is all of us at times hearing, but not doing. But that is some of you here right now. That is the experience of your life. I know what God wants. I know what He's calling me to. But I'm not doing it. Similar to number one. Similar to number two. Both the wise man and the foolish man succeed in building. And similar to number three. Let me read the text one more time. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell. And the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Similarity number three. Both the wise man and the foolish man will face storms. Both the wise man and the foolish man live in this world that we call a fallen world. And just because we know Jesus Christ, just because we're walking in His truth, is no guarantee whatsoever that you and I are going to miss the storms. The Bible says that the rain falls on the just and on the godless man. We live in a fallen world. And a fallen world is marked by storms. And both the wise man and the foolish man uh, will face those. Psalm 127 1 says this. Unless the Lord is the one building your house, you're laboring in vain. You're laboring in vain. It doesn't say, unless the Lord builds your house, you're just not going to build it. You're not going to be able to build it. It says, you're building a house, but you're just building and you're laboring in vain. Why? Because ultimately, it's going to crumble. Ultimately, the storm is going to come, and if I build those houses of my life apart from obedience to God's Word, then those houses aren't built properly, and they're just going to crumble. They're just going to fall apart. Unless the Lord builds our house, we're laboring in vain. Listen, people, we're building those homes. I hope that you are building those homes. I hope that you are building into your kids a desire and a passion for godliness. I hope that you're building in, into your relationship with your spouse uh, a, 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 a growth and, 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 and a strength that, that can weather uh, the storms. I hope that you're building into your own personal walk with God uh, 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 a ability, again, to weather those storms. But you're only doing that if you're allowing God to be the one who builds your life. Because you see, we're not building. You and I are not building for fair weather. Do you understand that? That's not what we're building. We're not building for 70 degrees and a light breeze for the rest of our lives. That's not what we're building for because that's not going to happen. We're building for the storms. If we're building for fair weather, you know what I can do? I can throw a book to my kids, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and say, read it, go to college, get a career, you'll be fine. If I'm building for fair weather with a relationship with my wife, you know what we can do? We can sit down and watch movies every night, go out to eat, hold hands, never pray together, never talk about Jesus together. We can leave out all of the important stuff of God's Word, and if all it is is 70 degrees and a light breeze, Jen and I are going to be just fine. But we're not building for fair weather. We're building for the storms. I wonder how, some of you own your own home. How many of you would be content if your builder came to you and he said, listen, we can knock a huge chunk of money off of the price of this house if you just let me cut some bars. <laughs> you won't even notice when this house is done. It's going to look just like the house beside it where they spent $50,000 more and they didn't cut any corners. And then he says this, as we're, oh, that sounds like a great idea. He says, just keep in mind, 
that if we do get a big storm, it may or may not stand. How many of you would be content to save the $50,000? It's a huge amount of money, but we wouldn't do it. Because we want to know that the investment that we're making we want to know when it's raining, when the wind's blowing, when the snow's falling down. We can go into that house and we can close the door, we can close the windows, and, and it is a place of safety, and we don't have to worry when that storm is over. Is the house still going to be standing? I didn't want to think about that. I don't even want that on my radar. Of course it's going to be. But why don't we have the same attitude about the spiritual houses of our lives? I want my kids to be crazy about Jesus. I want them to trust him because I know my kids are going to face storms. And, and when that storm comes and, 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 and it beats on them, this is a pretty intense storm that Matthew 7 describes. The rains fell and, and, and the winds blew and it beat against that house. When the storm comes in my kids' lives, I want them to cling closely to the rock that is Jesus Christ. When those storms come that are part of the marriage relationship. Because the devil, you know, and I know, wants nothing more than to destroy every marriage relationship in the church. And he's actively pursuing that goal. When those storms come, I want my marriage relationship to last for another 25 years. But not just to survive, but to thrive. Not just living together, but growing in Jesus Christ together and being in, in love with each other. How does that happen? It happens when you and I hear the word of God and we <laughs> submit to it. We obey it. I am, as you know, I say this very often, I'm very concerned about the state of the church. And for good reason. Statistically, I think presently, nine out of ten young people that are growing up in the church, growing up in Christian school, when they face the storm that eventually comes, that storm of secular humanism, just plain old secularism, the storm of uh, uh, the drive and, and, and the, the uh, um, encouragement to pursue uh, sexual uh, uh, intimacy apart from God's plan. When those storms come to our young people, 9 out of 10 are not weathering the storm. And they're walking and running away from Jesus Christ. I'm concerned about marriages in the church. Because it says statistically right now, over 50% of those who claim to know Jesus Christ are not surviving in their relationship with their spouse. When the storms, again, of uh, sexual uh, perversion, uh, sexual unfaithfulness, the storms of selfishness, the storms of, uh, 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 you name it, uh, a fear of, of intimacy, a storm of, uh, of just uh, argument, you name it, we can go right down through the list of the various storms that attack the marriage. 50% of them are not weathering the storm. And I'll tell you what, it's really hard to even find a church today where God's Word is esteemed and lifted up and seen as authoritative as it is and seen as sufficient as it is. Uh, it's hard to find a place where God's Word is preached without apology. Because right now, the church in America is facing a storm of political correctness. And it is attacked and it is beating down on preachers and on lay people alike. And most have succumbed to it. Most have fallen. And great has been the fall of it. God has called us to hear. He has called us to do. And uh, here's the thing about this passage. Um, it's a pretty discouraging passage, depending on your perspective. It's a warning. Do this or you are going to crumble. Submit to God. Obey Him. Pursue intimacy with Him. Know Him. Fall in love with Him. And we can think of all of the commands. The greatest command. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do that. Or we're going to crumble. It, it's, a, it's a harsh warning to every single person without exception. Because we're all going to face storms. So depending on your perspective, it's kind of discouraging. But it's also a very reassuring promise. 
that if you and I hear the Word of God and we obey it and we build our homes, but we build them on the obedience to God's Word, then we're going to build them and they're going to be strong. And when the storm hits, there's a promise from Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, our house is going to stand firm because it was built on the rock. That, that's encouraging. We often look at the negative side of Matthew 7, but it's encouraging. Listen to these verses. Those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. He fulfills the desires of those who fear Him. He also hears their cry and saves them. With perfect peace, you will protect those whose minds cannot be changed because they trust in you. Trust the Lord always because the Lord, the Lord alone, is an everlasting rock. The Lord is my strength and my song. He is my Savior. This is my God and I will praise Him. The Lord is near to all who call on Him, to all who call on Him in truth. We don't have to be a statistic. Our children do not have to be a statistic. Our marriages don't have to be a statistic. You and I can walk in obedience to God's Word. And He promises that as we do that, He will enable us. He will enable us to stand strong. I'm going to stop there and actually perhaps pick this up next week because I want to do something. Um, a lot. In fact, could the priest team maybe come forward and start playing that pure and holy passion song? That's all right. I want to, I, I don't know if you're like me, but there are many times that um, God speaks to my heart about something. And, and maybe I'm in a church setting, maybe I'm in a conference setting, maybe I'm just uh, reading the Bible, getting ready to go to work, and um, I say, I don't want to deal with that. I, I need to begin to deal with that. I, I need to just finally get around to deal with that. I'll tell you what, even as I was preparing this message, the Lord revealed a few more things, reminded me of a few more things um, that uh, uh, He wants to do in my life. Things, some new things, some things that He's told me before, and I just have yet to deal with them. And uh, I, have, I have a feeling that some of you have thought of one, one or two of these things. And uh, you maybe even thought, you know, when I get home, I'm going to deal with this. Uh, tonight, when I read my Bible, I'm going to deal with this. Tomorrow morning, when I wake up, I'm going to deal with this. I just want to encourage you as the music plays, you guys can start playing. Um, we're we're going to close with one pure and holy passion. Are you going back to that? Or you... I'm not going to do that. I'll do that next week, maybe. Okay. Um, we're going to sing one pure and holy passion. Don't sing it if you don't mean it. And listen. If God's spoken to your heart about something this morning and you're not willing to give it up, then you don't mean it. You do not mean that you want Jesus to be your pure and holy passion. If God has spoken to your heart about something and you're not willing to give it up. So I just want, uh, as the music plays, we're going to pray for a few minutes, just, just quietly. You and God deal with what's going on. And, uh, and then uh, after a little bit, I'll pray and uh, we'll, we'll close with give me one pure and holy passion.